Bernard Arivalo won the Guatemalan presidential election in August, but ever since, right-wing sections have been trying to prevent his taking over. Arivalo was supposed to be sworn in on Sunday, but the right-wing made a last-minute attempt to weaken his power in what is being called a coup attempt. With his supporters mobilizing on the streets and international pressure bearing down on his opponents, Arivalo finally did manage to take over on Monday, nine, nine hours after he was scheduled to. We go to Zoe to understand what happened on that Sunday. Zoe, thank you so much for joining us. A very eventful Sunday for the people of Guatemala. Could you take us through what happened? Why was there such a pushback against uh, Bernardo Arivalo's party and how was it overcome? Well, uh, Sunday, January 14th was the day that Bernardo Arevalo was set to be inaugurated as the next president of Guatemala. Um, and as we've been covering on People's Dispatch uh, over the past several months, um, there have been numerous attempts to undermine his electoral victory, uh, to remind viewers uh, he won the elections in Guatemala in August against Sandra Torres, the former uh, first lady. Um, his victory, again, was was perhaps uh, surprising to sectors of the ruling class um, that had long held control over power in Guatemala. Um, and even before he won in the second round, they'd already begun to maneuver to prevent his victory. Um, and then once he won, to really uh, prevent him from being able to take power. And this um, carried on really up until he was sworn in, which didn't end up taking place on Sunday, January 14th. Uh, he was sworn in on the morning of uh, January 15th, um, after hours of delays, of different um, attempts, of the kind of the last desperate attempts of uh, the right-wing coup supporting sectors to kind of um, thwart his ascension to power. Um, they did this through a variety of ways. They had already tried to ban his party, um, and when uh, the members of Congress were being sworn in, they tried to force members of Bernardo Arevalo's party, Movimiento Semilla, to be sworn in as independents. Of course, this would mean um, that within the Congress, they would not belong to Movimiento Semilla, um, and this sort of uh, weakens their power, and that his power, again, as president, uh, if he has no party uh, representation in Congress. Um, this maneuver, however, was met with widespread rejection, both within the Congress and on the streets. Um, something that we've also reported on is that through all of these attempted coup measures, uh, the indigenous movement, student movement, um, the movement against corruption in Guatemala has been really in support of uh, defending democracy, defending his candidacy, and then defending his victory. So already there were people mobilizing on the streets putting pressure on legislators uh, to not allow this to go through. And um, this attempt to kind of subvert and, uh, you know, again, ban the Semilla party was uh, reversed. Um, and a member of his party actually won um, the presidency of the Congress. Um, and many, many hours later on the morning of January 15th, Arevalo was sworn in. Uh, notably, his predecessor, Alejandro Giam Giamatti, uh, was not present, did not attend the swearing-in ceremony. I think it's important to note just because, um, you know, he's definitely one of the people that was behind and uh, was against an anti-corruption um, activist and politician being, you know, winning the presidency, having been accused of corruption himself, having... Uh, you know, benefited from the dismantling of the UN corruption investigation. So, you know, these are all really crucial elements. Uh, at the end of the day, the international delegations that were present for his inauguration put a lot of pressure um, on legislators. They all send an open letter. This is including um, the representative of the Organization of American State, the organ states, the uh, the representative of the European Union, who are all present uh, in Guatemala for this uh, inauguration, and then of course the different heads of state from the region, Gustavo Petro, Ziamara Castro. Uh, Gustavo Petro actually threatened to cancel his trip to Davos if Bernardo Arevalo was 
um, not able to take office. He said that he wouldn't leave Guatemala until he's sworn in. You know, important to point out because uh, Petro has also been, of course, under constant attack from the countries, from Colombia's right wing, um, and has resisted uh, these coup attempts on the streets with the people. So, uh, you know, a turbulent last 24 hours as the president-elect. However, he is now uh, sworn in as president. Um, he has thanked, for example, the indigenous communities that mobilized on the street that really um, were this uh, rear guard in, in defending him and democracy in, in Guatemala. There's already, it's important to note as well that, you know, this is someone who is not, um, you know, the, the U.S. was one of the countries that was also uh, calling on the right wing to back down and calling this an attempted coup. Uh, Arevalo has already had a meeting um, with the U.S. delegation. Um, it looks like they're going to have very friendly relations. We know that the U.S. is, is shifting its policy towards Latin America, especially Central America. Uh, Guatemala is one of the is the most is one of the most populous countries uh, in Central America, and of course um, has been a key partner. Uh, in with the U.S. in terms of its immigration policy. So these are all really key factors that we'll definitely have to keep looking out for. How does that evolve with his presidency? What kind of relationship is he going to have with the U.S.? Um, and, you know, how how will that play out, a positive relationship with the U.S.? Um, Guatemala, of course, has a, has a torrid history of U.S. intervention. So um, these are all key points uh, to continue to look out for. And of course, we know that, um, like in all cases, the right wing and the coup supporting right wing does not disappear after they fail. So that's something that will definitely continue to be there throughout his presidency. That will be a continued challenge for him to face um, these sectors that conspired using all branches of power at its disposal uh, in an attempt to subvert democracy and undermine the elections. Thank you, Zoe, so much for that update. COVID-19 may no longer be headline-worthy news, but it continues to take lives. By the end of 2023, 7 million people had died due to the disease since it broke out. The WHO has warned against complacency and insisted that vaccine programs continue. We go to Anna to understand where we are at in the fight against COVID-19. Anna, thanks for joining us. COVID-19 is an issue we have not talked about for a long time on this show. In fact, it has quite disappeared from the headlines uh, across the world. But the number is still very staggering, 7 million deaths. Uh, by the end of 2023, could you maybe first give us an overview of what is, you know, what the situation is with the pandemic regarding its spread? Well, despite the fact that COVID-19 is no longer in the news, uh, it's very much around us. And uh, that's something that uh, the, the World Health Organization made very clear in their beginning of the year address. So uh, as we enter, this is the fifth year of COVID-19. Uh, the health emergency, as we know, uh, as we have known it in 2020, is of course over, but that doesn't mean that uh, the disease is still not spreading. Uh, and it, as you pointed out, it's still killing people. So uh, what we have seen over the last weeks is that there is a new variant which is um, quite uh, <laughs> quite easily spread around. And thousands of people around the world are reporting problems. They're contracting the disease. Uh, we are seeing some numbers uh, that. Uh, in the times of a peak pandemic, uh, you know, would have meant a complete shutdown. We're not seeing that anymore because it's um, it somehow uh, people have gro uh, grown accustomed to the uh, to COVID nineteen. The governments have also. So what we are seeing is a much much more relaxed uh, approach to to something that uh, you know that, that's still causing disease and uh, making lives harder for for people around the world. Now. Also, as you rightly pointed out, you know um, what the WHO said during this uh, first press conference of the year uh, is that the number of deaths that we have seen from COVID nineteen since the since the beginning of the pandemic is incredible. So seven million deaths, and that's probably underreported. So that's also something that uh, the WHO is um, is pointing out. And what they're saying is that, of course, you know, uh, well, it's. Uh, it's understandable that our approach to COVID-19 has now changed. Uh, that does not mean that people should not still be, um, sh should not take precautions uh, against getting infected. Uh, and of course, that governments should, uh, should, uh, should in fact continue to uh, try and uh, ensure that people can access uh, 
protective equipment that they can get vaccinated and that they should uh, should explain why people should get all the vaccine doses that they can. So uh, the booster doses that are still there are very, very relevant still. Right now, this brings us to the second question always associated with COVID-19, but also health in general, the question of inequities and how they're continuing, continuing to sort of affect people. So how, you know, what is happening on that front? Has there been, uh, you know, has, has the gap been bridged, especially when vaccines are concerned? Well, um, several reports in the last couple of weeks have pointed out that health inequities, if anything, have gotten worse since the pandemic and that the pandemic was just another, you know, one, one other layer on top of it, everything else that we were already seeing. Uh, in addition to uh, to people dying, uh, to poor people dying more of COVID-19 than, than rich ones, uh, of course, we have also seen that uh, across the world, the, uh, the accessibility of COVID-19 vaccines is still very unequally spread. So, you know, while, um, while we're seeing that uh, in many countries in the global south, people are still not reaching the vaccination rates that we would aim for or that would have been aimed for during the, when the pandemic was news. On the other hand, we have a whole list of European countries that have destroyed millions and millions of vaccine doses over the last months because they have expired. So uh, some approximations put a cost uh, on billions of euros, essentially. And then uh, um, when we look at how much uh, how much European countries, countries of the EU have destroyed. It amounts to uh, to the health budget of some of the minor states in the EU. And uh, this, of course, is likely, to, uh, is likely to continue for a set of time because some of, uh, of the agreements signed between the EU, the EU members and the vaccine manufacturers actually bind the European countries to continue buying the vaccines uh, throughout years to come, although they're not using them. So uh, what we're seeing, of course, is that people, uh, the uptake is very slow. People are no longer interested. Governments are essentially no longer interested in tracking COVID-19 data, and that's likely to be a problem. But of course, you know, now we're coming back to the whole, uh, to, to the set of problems, of health problems that were caused by health inequities already before the pandemic. We know that people are still struggling in the global north, in the global south with cost of living crisis. Uh, food prices uh, make adequate nutrition out of reach for many. Uh, and essentially the, the, social, the social problems that, uh, that are increasing uh, are also likely to, uh, to continue influence health as well. Right, Anna, thank you so much for that update. And that's all we have in this episode of Daily Debrief. We'll be back with another episode tomorrow. In the meanwhile, do visit our website, peoplesdispatch.org and follow us on all the social media platforms.